Please be seated, O choir of angels. And now let's access our soul through our breath in another way by saying together the words in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin. When my hand drops, it's time to begin. It's a visual cue. You ready? Big breath first. God within and far beyond us, we lift to you thanksgiving for this time together. May we hallow it through action and through being your Christ in the world. Equip us to offer love to a world so often conflicted and divided. Guide our paths toward healing and living life abundantly. Help us to help others. We pray these things in Jesus' name and through the winds of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Nicely read, everyone. This is the time in the service when Sarah usually offers us a word of wisdom, and instead, in absentia, she has offered us this poem to hear together. For those unfamiliar with Mary Oliver, I think you're in for a treat. She's one of my favorite poets and my wife's as well. The name of the poem is The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last? And too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Amen. Did I collect all the prayer cards? Is there something I missed? I was afraid of that. Thank you. As we hear the words of scripture, let us listen in the words for the word of God. Today's scripture is Matthew 9, verses 35 through 10, 10, and 16 through 20. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labor laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. And Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Then these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of Samarians, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive it without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, 
or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. See, I'm sending you out like the sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents, yet innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. We got extra text up here. Give me two seconds. So many papers. Okay, we're going in. You ready? Maybe. According to legend, the Vatican archives hold many secret items in addition to the treasures they display for everyday public viewing. There are rumors of everything from absolute proof that Jesus never existed to the as yet unrevealed third prophecy of Fatima to evidence of Vatican interactions with extraterrestrial beings Yes, possibly including pacts of nefarious collaboration. But my favorite of the rumored artifacts is one which is called the chronovisor. Have you ever heard of that? It's made by Google. No. No, we'll get to it was made by in two seconds. It was said to have been constructed by a team of a dozen individuals over many years. And the only supposed collaborator to speak of it was the Catholic priest, Father Pellegrino Maria Ernetti, who passed away in the 1990s, just shy of his 70th birthday. As the name implies, the chronovisor allegedly allows the viewers to look back in time to witness historical events firsthand. The inventors of the chronovisor claimed who have looked back on classical plays from Greece and other curious events, and even, it is rumored, to view the final days of Jesus Christ on earth, everything from the Last Supper to the crucifixion. These adventures and spying on the past were said to have produced a photograph of Jesus praying in Gethsemane just prior to his arrest. Can you imagine actually being able to see such a moment? Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, as you may already have suspected, it was just all too good to be true. Upon closer inspection, the image was found to be a close-up picture of a well-known statue of Jesus from a Catholic church. And Father Ernetti was later reported to have confessed on his de deathbed to having made it all up. How I wish it were real. Not so I could eavesdrop on moments of pain and suffering in Jesus' life. I think that's an odd choice, don't you? No, I wish the chronovisor were real because I often wonder how modern eyes would view the distant past, even when seeing it directly. Because our cultures determine the way we see the world around us. They tell us how to frame objective things and people with shared subjective interpretations. And the cultures of modern day New England and ancient Palestine, Israel, encouraged and encourage radically different reads of the world around us, even if we were to view the same thing. Let's take a look at the marching orders Jesus gives the first apostles in this morning's reading to begin to unpack what I mean. The scripture tells us that Jesus assembled the twelve and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. 
And the text goes on to describe their shared methods of healing these ills as being to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and even cast out demons. This enumeration of ills and cures raises a few questions for me. I wonder about the nature of unclean spirits and disease and sickness and what exactly it means to cast them out. If I could only don a chronovisor to look at someone who had an unclean spirit from biblical times, what would I see with 21st century eyes? I suspect from the grouping of unclean spirit with disease and sickness that I would be looking at someone with a cold or a virus and possibly a very bad one. Today, we understand illness to be transmitted from person to person through extremely tiny germs. But the ancient biblical view of illness and being unclean was driven by a sense of spiritual infestation. Nice time. <laughs> Afflicted people were possessed by unclean spirits which altered human wellness. And such a possession was understood to be a moral problem. To be unclean was to be sinful, off, maladjusted, falling short of the blessing of physical wellness and right relationship with God. We're going to go for three? We'll see. <laughs> Such illnesses weren't the worst or most extreme forms of possession, to be sure, but no possession was a good thing, right? The connection of illness to spiritual failing is understood by the prescriptions of Jesus about to about how to cure them, underscored, sorry, by the prescriptions of Jesus about how to cure them. As he sends the apostles to the Jewish towns around them, he commands them to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Illness, death, leprosy, and demonic possession are all presented as related problems, which the apostles are given the authority to resolve somehow. We never get to know how. Bugs me which makes it sound like the apostles were superheroes who were just overflowing with godly power. And somehow Jesus just flipped a switch and enabled those superpowers in the first place. And we never get to know how that happened either, which galls me. All of which is why it can be so challenging to relate to biblical texts. Our individual worldviews and the worldviews of ancient times just don't seem to overlap sometimes. It's hard for modern people to accept people being restored to life from death or being possessed by demons at all. And so our willingness to embrace certain biblical passages can erode little by little if we approach them only from a modern perspective. As if because our modern views may doubt demons are real, it also means that the apostles were not up to something powerful and positive as they visited people working cures. Let me be perfectly clear about this. This is probably the topic sentence today. So, We are not off the hook as modern day disciples of Christ when it comes to curing the ills of the world, no matter how differently we may see or define them today. We are still called to work wonders and cure ills of the modern world, and to cast out the demons of our age. So let's run through those four big types of curing and casting out from our passage to show you what I mean. Just to reiterate, they are curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing leopards, and casting out demons. Curing the sick and cleansing lepers were acts of faith and spiritual power in Christ's day. But today, we don't hold ill people to be morally or spiritually challenged, which makes caring for them easier. In Jesus' time, even approaching the spiritually ill and unclean posed a threat to your own wellness and cleanliness. And you did not want to be unclean in an ancient Jewish setting. The potential contagion of spiritual impurity was a real concern. Which is why the Pharisees and the other so-called spiritual authorities were flabbergasted that Jesus would ever gather with sinners and tax collectors in the first place. Uh-uh. Too risky. You might catch some sin. Which might sound absurd now, 
since we no longer assume that people are spiritually unwell when they have a cold or a virus or collect taxes. We've also learned through scholarship that the biblical term leprosy really means any contagious skin disease, which, again, we no longer demonize now, especially since the advent of modern medicine has brought us many cures for many rashes. And that's all just modern common sense, no chronovisor needed, but raising the dead and casting out demons might benefit from a chronovisor, as they require a little bit more unpacking for modern sensibilities. So to begin with, I have a confession to make. I sometimes think that people being raised from the dead in the Bible may be a misunderstanding of when people were actually dead. And as it turns out, this is a problem which is still with us today. Did you hear the recent news story about the wake of the woman, the woman in Ecuador? If you did, raise your hand. Give me a... Just, okay, just a couple. Good. As her family was mourning her at her wake, they heard a knocking. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know where it was coming from. The coffin. From inside the coffin. The poor woman had actually not died and woke up while laying in her coffin. Can you imagine? Please no, Lord. Please no. Thankfully, she was not embalmed, right? <laughs> now, if a modern doctor could mistake a woman for dead, I have no doubt ancient people could also make a similar mistake. But unfortunately, that perspective seems to project widespread ignorance on the part of ancient people, which I find unsatisfactory. The mere passing of time, even coupled with vast technological growth, does not guarantee any general increase in intelligence or sophistication. We see that every day. But it's also true that the fear of death in the ancient world was such that even dying people were likely to be left alone and at a distance from others. So who knows? I remain open po to the possibility of miracle, if only because I've known great blessings and maybe a miracle or two in my own life. The demons and their casting out are even more of a challenge to a modern perspective. Now, when you think of a demon, you might be thinking of the horrific distorted monsters which filled up medieval bestiaries and magical tomes and Hieronymus Bosch paintings, but these are not that. In the Bible, there are a negative spiritual presence within someone which controls them. And I think I have seen that sort of demon and I think you have too. Sorrow, despair, poverty, social estrangement, social disadvantage, rage, being discriminated against just for being who you are or who you are drawn to love or being bullied, all have an effect on people's souls, just to name a few. A sense of estrangement seems particularly prevalent in the biblical depiction of demon-possessed people. They're often on the edge of town or living alone in a graveyard, popping out to rage against passers-by. They're the outcasts, those who have been disallowed to maintain healthy relationships within their culture. They're the oppressed, the downtrodden, the hated. They're demons, not because they're unholy, but because they are demonized by the majority of those in authority. So we can absolutely cast out demons in the here and now by opening our hearts to the other, by widening our sense of kinship to explicitly include people who are different from us and may even apparently be opposed to us, by loving our so-called enemies and purposefully pushing the circle of God's grace to widen until it includes everybody. I've heard a saying that the only way to get into heaven is by walking in holding the hands with your enemy. I think that is a great Christian mission statement for the here and now. After all, the, our text tells us the apostles were told, as you go, proclaim the good news 
The kingdom of heaven has come near. That's not about tomorrow or years and out from now or somewhere up on the top of the dome of heaven. It's about right now. As Christians, we are called to mend divisions, embrace differences, and to stop demonizing people instead of welcoming them and loving them. It is those actions which kindle the kingdom of heaven right now. It can be easy to look at the fantastical elements of scripture and scoff because such things don't easily fit in with our modern perspectives. And that may be an inevitable consequence of cultural and historical differences. But if we are to be faithful to the man from Galilee, we must commit to taking a walk in his way however we are able. Like the first apostles, we are called to work wonders and love the other until we're all one human family. We are called to improve and transform the world so that it shines with the light of the holy instead of sitting in its own shadows. And that is the commission from Matthew's gospel this morning. Can I get an amen? Amen.
kind of feel like I don't need to pray now. <laughs> Wasn't that gracious and gorgeous? Amen, amen, amen. Lovely, lovely. Thank you both so much. I love about the violin that it, um, you know, I'm a guitar player, so you always have to have your finger up on the fret, and there's none of that. There's pure freedom, just flow. And... Thank you. All right, friends, it is time for us to pray together. So let us begin with a deep breath to center ourselves in the Spirit of God. Holy and gracious God, we begin today with our prayer requests gathered from this morning's worship. We lift up a prayer of concern from Barbara Powell. She asks us to pray for a dear family. Life support has been removed from the father and it's been very difficult and will continue to be as four generations adapt to this time of major transition. God, we know you are our shepherd here and in the world to come. Be with all of them, guiding them onward, loving and beloved God. We want to lift up a prayer of celebration by someone who has chosen not to be named, did write their name in, but then crossed it out. And we're going to lift up prayers for all graduates this spring. As they step out into the larger world beyond high school or college, and may they be safe and strong in their journey, loving and beloved God. And we're lifting up a thanksgiving from Bill and Nancy Ross. Bill is a great, great, no, sorry. <laughs> You're not that old, Bill, sorry. Bill is a great grandfather. It says, hard to believe. And this name I might not get exactly right, I pray God guides me, Amiri. Stephen Ramirez, who was born on June 15th, seven pounds, one ounce, 19 inches long, to Bill's granddaughter, Sierra White. What a blessing. Lord God, be with that child and that family and those sleepless nights to come as that child grows in grace. Loving and beloved God. And we're lifting up prayers of compassion for those afflicted by mental illness, and suicidality. May someone near them reach out, loving and beloved God. We continue to remember our uh, sister church, First Congregational in Spencer. It was devastated by fire. We lift up to your care for vision, for support, for just a sense of your presence, God. We lift up uh, Reverend McLeod, all the members of the congregation and all those whose hands will help heal this. Loving and beloved God. And I want to lift up uh, Bobby Renier. I may be mispronouncing his name. Our poet, usually in the front rows, who was in the hospital recently, but is home safe now. May he continue to heal. Maybe he's there until he's with us again, loving and beloved God. And I want to lift up uh, prayers on behalf of Tom and Marilyn Nystrom, their um, grandson Tyler is at the Hartford Hospital with a head injury. He's making good progress but he's not out of the woods completely. He's stabilized. And uh, Ivor Nystrom, who's 92 years old, this is uh, Marilyn's sister-in-law, and in failing health. And Tom, who is anticipating um, angioplasty on the 27th. That is a lot for that family. I spoke with them yesterday, um, and let's speak to God about them now, loving and beloved God, hear our prayer. Once again, from Sunday to Saturday this week, there have been 18 incidents 
of mass shooting in 13 states, resulting in 15 deaths and 79 injuries. Holy God, we are asked to be the people who do not live or die by the sword. May we have the wisdom to find a way not to live and die by the gun. Guide us in this, loving and beloved God. I want to lift up uh, the Ukrainians who are besieged, all those who are victims of war, not only for the loss of human life, but for all the damage it does to God's good green earth. We were given this place as a garden to till and to keep, and we have turned it into a parking lot. God, forgive us for our war. God, forgive us for our desire to make things in our image. Help us remember who is God, loving and beloved God. And in this Pride Month, I want to lift up the events at the Wells Road Elementary School, which are not unique. There is so much going on in this country right now to push back on people who are other, who are not that neat little dyad that people hold on to with white knuckled hands. Help us get beyond that. Help us grow. Help us learn what love means. Loving and beloved God. And Holy One, I've been lifting up the good work of this congregation and becoming one from two. I will continue to do so. I also want to lift up the fact that there are challenges in that braiding, that there are some who may not feel heard, that there are some who might feel injury, that there are some who may walk away. But with the understanding that going forward, this will be one church. Guide them, bless them, and not least with Rev. Liz's arrival, shower them with love and beauty, loving and beloved God. And now, Holy One, hear as these, your people in the pews, as they are moved to do, lift their prayers up to you. We're lifting up the senselessly slaughtered Ugandan families um, from yesterday. There's so much death in this world, God. Lead us to better ways, loving and beloved God. We're lifting up a sister-in-law diagnosed with breast cancer. May the journey go as well as it can, and may your grace be known by all who accompany her, loving and beloved God. And as we consider for whom we might pray today, let us take a moment to remember our fathers, those who helped us enter this world, and those who may not be our literal fathers, but who gave us support and direction along the way. I invite you, as you feel moved to do, to lift up a name of someone you honor as father in your life at this time. And I'll begin. Emmett. John. Jerry. Walter. 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 And for those whose relationship with their father may be strained, we wish blessings. We wish possibilities of newly formed families, families of choice that may give them support and love and uplift. Are there other prayers we should lift together today, my friends? There is one. It's the prayer which Jesus taught the first disciples. It's printed there in your bulletin. There are many different versions of it. I think it's always important to pray from the heart as we're able. So I invite you to lift up that prayer, that version of what we call the Lord's Prayer, which makes your heart sing in this moment today. And again, let's take a deep breath. And let us begin. Our Creator, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our last work of soulful breath work together will be to sing our closing hymn, God's Eye is on the Sparrow. It's number 475 in your black book. As you go forward into the world, along with the sparrows who God is watching, may you love God so much that you love no one or nothing else too much. And may you fear God just enough that you need fear nothing else. Go in peace, people of God. Amen.